Good evening. Good to be back with you. All made it safely here. I, I uh, checked the radar uh, before I left to make sure that the pastor's car had landed in the touchdown, and then I came on behind him, so uh, I must not get in front of him. But, uh, uh, I, you know, what I love about going to different churches is you always see and hear different things. Uh, I, I try to be very observant. Uh, while we were, and by the way, I always feel at home in a place where you use the old Church of God redback hymnal. You do realize your hymnal, that is the King James of songbooks. That is a, uh, that is a great songbook. But uh, it seemed like, unless my hearing's bad while you're singing Heaven's Jubilee, when you got to the part of shouting, I heard some... I thought I was at a Ric Flair, Ric Flair wrestling match or something. I wasn't sure. Who started that? Everybody's pointing at everybody else. Nobody's taking response. <laughs> Those are the things that make uh, each church uh, unique. Um, and, uh, <laughs> um, and uh, of course, they've asked me uh, here, you know, I guess it's for Brother Soundman to write it down or title it, or uh, my sermon title, which always kind of makes me nervous because sometimes there have been times that... Uh, the Lord changes your mind, and uh, but uh, I was reminded of uh, the uh, fella uh, back in uh, in eastern Kentucky. My dad's from West Virginia, across the river, eastern Kentucky, and in the hills of West Virginia and eastern Kentucky, they have what's called old time regular Baptist. Uh, they they nickname them hard shell Baptist. They uh, they don't have any musical instruments in their church. They don't believe in them. And uh, the pastor, uh, you know, for funerals an all-day event. There's four or five. It's like tag teaming, preaching. And uh, I can't even really, but I wouldn't even try to imitate the style of preaching that they do. It's half singing, half hacking. Does anybody in Virginia know what a hacking preacher is? <laughs> Somebody sounded like they're out of breath, you know. And uh, so uh, the story is told in eastern Kentucky. There, it was a summer day, and of course the old country church had no air conditioning. And uh, the preacher at the old regular Baptist church was getting in a big way. And uh, he got all carried away. And he said, well, I, I said, open them doors and open them wide. <laughs> Let them sinners come inside. Yeah. And everybody's hooping and hollering. And uh, there was even a few, woo. Uh, you know, everybody's getting excited. <laughs> and uh, it felt so good. He said again, I said, open them doors and open them wide. <laughs> Let them sinners come inside. Yeah. And, I mean, there was a big ruckus going on. And the windows were open, of course, because it was hot. And there was a construction crew working across the holler. And this fellow was an atheist. He had no fear of God. He said, that preacher is getting on my nerves with that racket. If he says that one more time, I'm going to take one of these concrete blocks and knock him out right in the pulpit. No sooner did he got it out of his mouth. I said, open them doors and open them wide. <laughs> Let them sinners come inside. Yeah. So sure enough, he had no fear of God. He took the concrete cinder block, went to the side door, which was open, and uh, right by the pulpit, timed it up, gave it a heave and go. The concrete block went airborne, hit the preacher in the head, knocked him out cold in the pulpit. Of course, that stopped the service, and uh, the deacons got, somebody got some smelling salts, and the deacons poured some water on the preacher trying to revive him, and finally he staggers up, comes back to consciousness, and they said, Pastor, do you want us to cancel, to stop the service? He said, no, put me back in the pulpit. I got another word from the Lord. He said, well, close them doors and close them quick. Some poor sinner done chunked a brick. Yeah. And so, uh, <laughs> so uh, sometimes the message changes. And, uh, but I think we got what we're supposed to have to, tonight. If you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. I was in Crossville, Tennessee at camp meeting last year and two little girls came up to me and said, we remember what you preached last year. I said, bless your heart, what is it? They said, open them doors and open them wide. I said, I wish somebody would remember something spiritual, I said somewhere along the line. But uh, <coughs> <coughs> Acts chapter <coughs> 11, and we're going to look at verse uh, 19. Acts chapter 11 and verse 19. <coughs> Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenice 
and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. And then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch, who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord, for he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. Thank you, sister. That's just, that right there, you know what that means? That's added an hour and a half to this sermon, so you can thank, you can thank her. Verse 25, then departed Barnabas to Tarshish for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. The church here is in its infant stages. The, the, the New Testament church is just beginning. Deacons have just been chosen for the first time to take care of the ministering to the widows in the church. You will remember that what has just happened is that that preaching deacon, Stephen, got up full of the Holy Ghost and he preaches. And he stirs those in the crowd so much so that they pick up rocks and stone him and Stephen becomes the first early church martyr. Persecution begins on the church. And the church is scattered abroad. There are Christians in North Africa, all the way to the Mediterranean islands and all the way to the Syrian city of Antioch. And it is there in this passage of Scripture that I've read in your presence tonight that some Greek-speaking Jews have met the Lord and revival breaks out. We're talking about revival. We're in the first day of revival. You say, how do you know a revival broke out? Well, it says, I read to you, the hand of the Lord was upon them. I'd say you need that for a revival, don't you? A great number believe. That's a byproduct of revival. When the church gets right and God's people get right and then people will get saved because of that. And they turned, a great number turned unto the Lord. So revival is broken out all the way in Antioch. And apparently good news travels fast because the mother church back in Jerusalem hears the word of all the exciting things that are happening in Antioch and they have now sent a missionary private eye, an investigator named Barnabas to come and see what's going on in Antioch. And in verse 23... I've read all this tonight. Barnabas comes and he experiences something that absolutely energizes and excites him. He gets so excited, he gets, he, it makes him glad. He begins to exhort and encourage the early, these young converts. He runs and gets help. He gets Paul and they stay together a year discipling and encouraging these young Christians. And what happens there is so impressive that the people in the area are paying attention and they're seeing what is happening with these followers of Christ, that they give them a name. And you see it is that name that has stuck for hundreds of years because we're still called by it today, but the Bible tells us that they, those followers of Christ in the early church, were first called Christians at Antioch. My question tonight is, what was it that Barnabas saw that got him so stirred up? What was it that was so exciting and so thrilling that got everything charged up? I think that's an important question as we look at revival. 
as we look at a service and we talk about and by your uh, vote, many of you raised your hand tonight that you want to see revival break out. Well, what was it that Barnabas went and observed that was so great? Well, let me first tell you what it was not. It was not some beautiful, thank God you've got a beautiful church bed. I'm, I'm struck, I'm, I've always, I was struck when I first got here uh, <clears throat> back all those years ago how pretty of a building. But they didn't have any pretty building because they were meeting from house to house at this time. This is the church in its infancy. So he, it wasn't some nice building that he saw. It wasn't some really cool pastor with uh, some... Uh, you know, tie-dyed jeans or uh, maybe somebody, you know, running around. It wasn't some great worship team, the preacher in a pair of uh, <clears throat> orange tights running around doing the hoochie-coochie waving a praise banner. By the way, how many are glad that the evangelist is not in orange tights tonight? Praise the Lord. <laughs> how many is glad that the pastor is not in orange tights? Some of you just got a visual of those two things that you'll never get out of your mind now. But it wasn't some super cool person. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll never be the cool preacher. You know, somebody said, why don't you get your ears pierced? I said, if I get my ears pierced, gravy would run out of my, you know, I'm not going to do that. <clears throat> it wasn't the credentials that they had. It wasn't, it wasn't their cool clothes. It wasn't their great singles outreach, a, a latte bar, a lights and smoke and mirrors. It wasn't any of those things. They didn't have any of those things. Acts 19 and verse 23 says that when Barnabas got there and saw, said he saw the grace of God. You ever seen that before? What an unusual statement. Barnabas saw the grace of God. I find that striking. I want you to know most of my life, I've been in church all my life, I have heard about grace. My goodness, uh, you know, and preachers down through the years, I have a sermon uh, just specifically on the word grace and preachers have tried to describe it and define it. Some have used, you know, you've probably heard that acronym where they take the letters of the grace and define it, God's riches at Christ's expense. I uh, have heard about grace all of my life. Of course, we've sung about grace. Probably the number one most known gospel song of all time written by that English slave trader, John Newton, who said it best, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. <clears throat> hey, I have experienced grace. 1975, as a six-year-old boy in vacation Bible school on a Friday night at the Grace Brethren Church in Worcester, Ohio, I bowed my head and gave my heart and life to Jesus Christ. And grace became real to me. I preached about grace. We've heard it. We've sung it. We've experienced it. That's not what it says in verse 23. It says that Barnabas saw. He looked at the grace of God. My question tonight in this message is very simple. Has anybody seen grace? Now, what does that mean? What does it mean? You ought to think when you come to church. What does it mean when it's, the Bible says that Barnabas saw the grace of God? What I believe that I think you would agree with me that I would say what, the, what that means is that Barnabas had to see the grace of God exemplified in the changed life of the early believers there at Antioch. Because when you come to Christ, how many know it's going to change you in some way? Little girl came home from Sunday school. She said to her dad, Dad, how big is Jesus? He said, what? He said, how tall is Jesus? He said, I don't know. Ask your mother. Mom was in the kitchen getting Sunday dinner ready. She said, Mommy, how big is Jesus? She said, I don't know. Go ask your father. She already did. They go back and forth, and she's driving them crazy. They finally said, why do you want to know this? She said, well, said, uh, Sunday school this morning, our teacher said that when we ask Jesus 
to save us and forgive us of our sins, he comes and lives on the inside of us. And said, during church, I got to thinking about that, I'm about four foot tall. And if Jesus is about six foot tall and he lives on the inside of me, he ought to stick out somewhere. <laughs> hey, if Jesus lives in you, if you've been touched by his grace, he ought to stick out somewhere. Amen. My question remains. The Bible says that Barnabas went to Antioch and he saw the grace of God. My question tonight here in this service, has anybody seen grace? And I'd like to stand with Barnabas and raise my hand. And say, yes, Barnabas, I know what you're talking about. I can relate because I also have seen grace. I look back on my life. I told you I got saved when I was six. Some of you are not maybe going to agree with this next part. If you got heart medicine, you might be, might be get it out. But when I was nine years old, I accepted, I surrendered to call to preach and preach my first sermon shortly thereafter in third grade. A lot of people, come. I've had people come up to me and say, I don't know if I believe that or not. No offense, I was there when it happened. <laughs> not a lot of people take you seriously when you're at nine years old and you say you're going to be a preacher. You know, I had, had two, I had two uncles that were very prominent preachers in our area. My great-grandfather was a circuit riding preacher in the hills of West Virginia, Kentucky. It's sort of like the family business. And so, you know, Susie wants to be a nurse, Johnny wants to be a fireman, Jimmy wants to be a preacher. Okay, go pray, go, go play. But th there was a couple people that took me seriously. In third grade, I, we had, I just started attending a small Christian school in our area. Very, very small, uh, probably K through 12, maybe 70, 80 kids. And uh, on Mondays of school, the school week, uh, we would all gather together for a little, like a chapel service, scripture reading song. I'll never forget, our principal, Don Ballard, came out and in a booming voice in front of the whole school said, Where's Jimmy McCombs? Everybody got quiet, because how many know when the principal calls you out by name, usually it's not good. They thought I was going to get it for something. He got quiet, I raised my hand, he's walking over, everybody's watching. He's got something in his hand. He said, Jimmy, I heard some news about you. Heard you surrendered a call to preach. I said, yes, sir. And he said, I want you to know I'm proud of you, and I'm going to be praying for you. And then he handed me a gift, which was from his own library. It was a Ryrie adult study commentary on the book of John. Now, look, third grade. I mean, I wish I could tell you I got something real deep in my devotions in third grade from a Ryrie adult study. I mean, I wasn't the sharpest knife in the drawer in the third grade. I was the last person to write and learn to write cursive. I was the last person to learn my multiplication tables in fifth grade. Matter of fact, when I learned my multiplication tables, I was the last one and I had to sing them to learn them. Matter of fact, if you asked me what eight times eight was tonight, I'd have to go eight times eight is 64. Eight times, is that right? 40, 48, 56, that's right. I didn't get much out of that as a nine-year-old, but I tell you what I did get. Somebody who I looked up to and respected had just validated a decision I had made for Christ. You know what I saw that day in that book and that man in front of all of my peers taking me seriously and believing in me? I saw the grace of God. Between my junior and senior year of high school, I went to a little independent Baptist church in West Salem, just out in the country. Our pastor's name is Carlos Fern Browning from the hills of West Virginia. We were a country church. I had some missionaries to France had come to our school, and I wanted to, I kind of felt led to go work with them over the summer between my senior year, before my senior year of high school. And they said, We've got a program like that. This is 1986 with the airfare and everything, about $1,500. I could go on this mission trip. I mean, it might as well have been $15 million. We didn't have any money. And, uh, Pastor Brown, he said, get a sermon together. You're going to preach on Sunday night. Okay. So I get up on Sunday night in our country church. I preach. And before I give an invitation or pray or anything, 
Pastor Browning is there, and he's got his arm around me in the pulpit. And I thought, what is going on here? He looked out at the congregation. He said, that was a good sermon Jimmy just preached, wasn't it? Yeah. Amen. As good as a 16-year-old just learned how to preach, you know. He said, and you want a copy of that, don't you? We gave away any of our sermons on cassette tape. Uh, young people, that was right after eight-track tapes and the, the records I was talking about this morning. Ask somebody, they'll tell you what a cassette tape is. Uh, he, we gave them away for free. Anybody wanted to serve us, one of our services. He said, you want that sermon so bad. He said, there was, he, he pointed down to the communion table down front. There was a, a yellow legal pad down there. He said, we've got a sign-up sheet down here, and you all are going to sign up to pay $5 a piece to get that, and we're going to send this boy to France. And he's closing in prayer. And I mean, I'm in tears walking off the stage. I'm thinking, Pastor Browning, no disrespect, but you've lost your mind. I mean, isn't that what everybody wants to do? To pay $5 for something, for a sermon of a kid preacher, which is usually free anyway? Well, I thought to myself, there ain't nobody going to go for that deal. You know, you have snapshots in your mind from your childhood. I will never forget. When the amen was said of that prayer, I'll never forget. We didn't have, we didn't have any wealthy people. It's country folks, farmers. I'll never forget. They were lined. They were lined down the altar. I remember Eunice Shook was in the front of the line. She was pouring Job's turkey. I mean, she, did, she didn't have any money. But they didn't pay just $5. Some of them paid $25. Some of them paid $50. Some of them paid $100. That's an expensive cassette tape of a kid preacher. You know what I see? You, in my mind today, you know what I see? All these years later. Has anybody seen grace? I've, I've seen grace. <clears throat> As pastor, we didn't have, I preached, I pastored 10 miles from where I was born, same county I was born, for 21 years before I moved, we moved to Tennessee. Um, we didn't have a lot of major problems in our church, but when we had problems, boy, we had good ones, some <laughs> big ones. And uh, we were going through a particularly difficult time. Our boys were just very young. Our two boys, Matt and Aaron, they were very, very young. And uh, I tried very hard not to take church home with me. I tried to leave it at the church. But apparently on this Sunday night, I was not doing a very good job. Apparently I was lost in deep thought about these problems we were having. I was laying on the couch. I'll never forget it. And all of a sudden, there is a presence beside me kneeling at the couch next to me. It's our two boys. And I looked down and I'll never forget. They said, Dad, you are the greatest preacher we have ever heard. And they had a piece of paper and they had written down some sermon titles of some of the sermons that I had preached. Now you say, that's, that's silly. Let me tell you something. At that moment, I was lowering a snake's belly. It wouldn't have been any better if the angels from heaven would have anointed my head with hot fires, fiery coals. I'm telling you. You know what I saw? My boys. Has anybody seen grace? Oh, yes. I, I have seen grace throughout my life in changed lives of believers just like Barnabas did. I'll never forget in our church uh, as pastor, we had a, a family, the Kick family. Their, one of their young sons named Matt, he told me on a Sunday night he wanted to get saved, came to my office after church, led him to the Lord, and we went, our family and their family went to Fazoli's, it was a fast food Italian restaurant there a little <clears throat> down the road here from our church, and we're standing in line. I'm behind the Kick family. The Kick boys are up there, there's a family of boys, and they're getting their little children's me uh, meal there, a toy came with each meal, like a Happy Meal. Uh, I watched as they gave Ben Kick his toy and his meal, and then they looked at Matt. The boy just got saved. And the waitress said, I'm sorry, but this is a, the truck comes in on Monday. It's Sunday night. We're out of toys. I'm so sorry. I don't have any more. I watched then as Matt, who had the last toy, Ben didn't get one. I watched as he took his toy off his plate and gave it to his younger brother, and I watched the waitress as she said, son, that's a very nice thing to do. He said, do you know why I did that? I knew what was coming. She said, why'd you do that? He said, because I got saved tonight. Yeah. 
I have seen grace in the toughest, most tragic moments of my life. Many of you know, some of you may not know, that the year after that I was here uh, in 2017, our family suffered the greatest tragedy a family could suffer. We lost our oldest son at the age of 23. And, uh, you know, people kind of are scared of talking to people or they, don't, they, they, they shy away from people when they have a tragedy like that because they don't know what to say. Can I give you a hint? There isn't anything to say. But sometimes it's just your presence. I was in California the night our son died. I will never forget. I was working for home missions. David flew me through the night to get back home. Early on a Sunday morning, 6 o'clock on a Sunday morning, Nashville Airport. It's early. I get off the plane. I go down the concourse. I will never forget our pastor, Corey Mender, co cup of coffee in his hand. It's 6 o'clock. He's got to preach here in a couple hours. He got up at 4 o'clock in the morning. I don't remember anything he said. It doesn't matter. It was inconsequential. But I will never forget his presence there. I, I remember a week later going to our home church there in Ohio and I remember the viewing and hundreds and hundreds of people, hours coming through. I don't remember anything anybody said but I tell you a moment I will never forget in that time in that viewing. This is Ohio. And I'm standing and in our church building you could look out the, the, the doors back here, the glass doors, you could see the parking lot from where I'm standing at the foot of the pulpit. And the people are coming and I look out the window and I see a man in a beard getting out of his car, walking into the church. His name is Gordon Boring. Gordon Boring is the adult Sunday school teacher at the First Free Will Baptist Church in Crossville, Tennessee. I'm not personal friends with Gordon Boring. I just recently had my first meal. I've never been in his home. We're not close friends. I just go and preach every year at Crossville. I sit in his Sunday school class every year. That's it. And I'm, I'm, I'm not believing what I'm seeing. And what I found out later was that Gordon Boring had got in his car in Crossville, Tennessee, drove eight hours to Creston, Ohio, got in, stood in line for two and a half hours, said and paid his respects to our family, got in his car, and drove back to Crossville, Tennessee. Now, let me tell you, I still go to Crossville. I'll be going here in a couple months, and I'll still be sitting in Gordon's Sunday school class. And I always thought he was a good Sunday school teacher, but let me tell you something. To me now, he's the greatest Sunday school teacher that ever walked the earth. You know why? Because I will never forget. I don't remember anything anybody said, but I remember. Hey, talk about grace. Anybody seen grace? I'd like to testify. You know, my heroes are differently now. Uh, and when we moved to East Tennessee, our pastor, obviously, knowing what our family was going through, he introduced us to a family in our church by the name of Jennifer and David Martin. Jennifer and David Martin lost their 15-year-old son, Adam, several years ago uh, to spinal meningitis. He went to school totally healthy, got a headache, went to football practice, came home sick, and 48 hours later, he is gone, 15 years old. And I'll never forget being in their home and, and sharing with them as only people who, you know, share a tragedy like that can share. I'll never forget going to church that Sunday. And our choir, we have a big praise choir, big 60, 80 voice choir at, at uh, Valley Forge, Free Will Baptist Church where we're members. And I'll never forget looking up and seeing Jennifer Martin singing, tears streaming down her face. And here's the word she was singing, you give and take away, you give and take away, my heart will choose to say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. I think that gets all of heaven's attention, don't you? I'm talking about has anybody seen grace? Her husband David's one of the sound men in our church and during COVID, how many know we all became TV evangelists? You know, we weren't having services and so I was there on a Sunday morning. They've asked me to preach on Sunday morning. There's only but three people in the building. Giant sanctuary. I'm singing a song that I have sung for years. I sang it here, I'm sure, when I was here before. And uh, I know the words backward and forward. But, man, there's just something about, and your pastor knows it. I mean, it's trying to create some excitement in an empty building. You know, it's very distracting. I mean, I was trying, and I forgot the words of that song. I mean, I was all tore up. I was singing before I preached. Song a good friend of mine in Tampa, Florida wrote, 
uh, he's still been a good God to me. And I was getting down to the chorus, and here's, I'm singing, he's good when I'm happy, and he's good when I'm sad, and he's good when I'm somewhere in between. And he's good when the billows have over me rolled. And he's good when I've won victory. And so I declare to the forces of Satan that no matter what my circumstance be, with all of my praise, I'll say of my Savior, he's still been Good God to me. And I look back in the sound booth in an empty building. And there is David Martin tragically lost his 15-year-old son suddenly. And David Martin is standing at the sound booth with both hands in the air praising the Lord. He's still been a good God to me. Hey, has anybody seen Grace? Barnabas, I'm right there with you. I have seen it so many times in my life and ministry. And here's the challenge tonight. When's the last time somebody walked away from you and their lives were changed, they were better for the experience and they have seen and experienced the grace of God and yes, the pandemic has taken much from us and pandemic has limited us in many different ways and we know that some churches have not made it, they've not survived and others may never go back to way, the way they were and there's all kinds of things that have happened and, 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 and trouble has come and, and tragedies and, and, uh, and, and how many know this church has experienced its bumps in the road? I mean, it's not always been a bed of roses and everything and uh, as, as we go through life. But the need in this community has never been greater. This church needs, this community needs to see. To see grace. Amen. Not, not, they don't need to hear you singing about it. They don't need to know you're having a study on it. Or you're preaching on it. They need on a daily basis as you go out of this building to see the grace of God. You see, Scripture is fine and stand with the book and preaching is great and, and obviously I believe in that. I wouldn't be here and revival is great. But if we are going to reach this community in this age for Christ, if we're going to see revival, people are going to have to see the grace of God. You are the only Bible some people are ever going to read. I wonder if anybody's seen grace lately around Louisa, Virginia. See, God's been teaching me this. I, I, I don't know. I haven't updated you. Uh, the last time I was here, I worked for the home missions department, working in church revitalization. Three and a half years ago, I became the executive director and CEO of Free Will Baptist Family Ministries. We have all kinds of information back there. It's free to, to take off the table. Free Will Baptist Family Ministries is the largest ministry in the world in Free Will Baptist. We have over 200 employees across three states. We have uh, four children's homes and a full, two full foster care programs. We take care of about 125 kids on a daily basis in our, in our care. We have two uh, assisted living, so we take care of about 100 elderly folks on a daily basis. We have a crisis pregnancy center. We just this week cut the ribbon on a brand new maternity home for unwed mothers. So we're not only going to save the life of the baby, but we've got a maternity home right next door to the crisis pregnancy center. Any church in America, this church, if you have a young lady that needs a place to stay, we're going to have, we've got an apartment open for, uh, it's just, it's the best kept secret in the denomination. We've got a 200 acre camp. Um, we, we've just got a lot of, a lot of, a lot of things going on. But, uh, I have a heart for our, for our kids. And uh, not too long ago, every Thursday if I'm home, in fact, I'll leave here Thursday morning and I will go straight to campus so I don't miss. At 4 o'clock, ha I have devotions and a meal. I, not just not cafeteria food. I, 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 <clears throat> I cart in whatever they want. Usually it's Taco Bell. Go figure. 
Anything you want, Taco Bell. But uh, shared devotions and a meal. We have some rough boys. I mean, we have only boys on our campus. We have boys and girls in our, in our places in Arkansas. But uh, we've got boys been in gangs. Boys have been in trouble. Uh, our boys sometimes run. Uh, sometimes they don't do very nice things. Uh, they don't use very nice language. They're rough. And uh, I usually start by sharing our family story, and then I share the story and the history of family ministries, of our ministry. And uh, then I, we take prayer requests. And, but I got done one day, and one of our new boys, he's st- sitting in the back there listening to everything I said. And uh, I hadn't done my devotion yet. He said, I got a question. All that stuff you just talked about, uh, all those employees and all those places, said, who's the, who's the boss, the main boss over all that? I said, it's me. He said, you mean you're the man? I said, I know it's hard to believe for me too. I bet that said they put me in charge of it. He said, you're the man? I said, I'm the man. He said, well, if you're the man, I got some things I want to say to you. I said, okay, I'm all ears. He said, there's some things we need around here. I said, okay, what do you need? He said, well, for one thing, we need some better deodorant. That's the deodorant they give us when they're here. It's cheap stuff. It crumbles. It's, it's old or something. So we need some better deodorant. And then uh, somebody said, yeah, we need some, like, some body wash. So I said, okay, Josh was sitting right here. I know he always kept paper and pen with him. I said, Josh, get your notebook out and start making notes because I'm never going to remember all this stuff. And uh, I'm having him write all this stuff down. And I said, I, I promise you. And, and I do. Listen, Jesus said I was in prison and you visit me. Our, our boys, our kids aren't in prison, but they're not, they're, they're with us not because they want to, it's because of their families are unable to take care of them. And if I can do something that's going to make their time with us a little bit better, I'm going to do it. Amen. I'm talking about before reading scripture, before devotion, I took a list. I took it, I take it very seriously. I listened to them. And Josh folded up the list. They, were, they went into all kinds of wild things, more, more time on their phone calls and stuff that I don't have the authority to, you know. But anyway, I folded it and put it in my Bible. I was preaching this sermon I just preached to you for the first time that Sunday at our church in, in Elizabeth. During COVID, again, nobody there, preaching it to the camera. And I'm preparing, I'm studying that week. And I forgot, I'd forgotten about that list. And the list was in my Bible. And while I'm studying for this sermon, that list fell out. And Josh had made the list of all the requests. And at the bottom, he'd drawn a line. I have a copy. I took a picture of it. I've got it in my phone. He, here's what he wrote at the bottom. He said, this is just a list of the things that we asked for. We realize that we probably cannot receive everything that's on this list. Although we are very thankful and very grateful for everything that is given to us. And you know what? Josh is absolutely right. Our boys are very, for the most part, very grateful. They will thank Mary, my assistant, when she brings that meal in. They, they, they thank and very polite to me. And uh, I mean... I read that, and I mean, it, I mean, I went all to pieces. That tore me up. I tried to read it to my wife. I said, look at this. And it touched me so much, I took a picture of it and put it in my PowerPoint for, my, for this message. And I closed the message by telling that story I just told you. And I said, do you know what I'm going to do tomorrow? I'm not going to read those boys another devotion, a lesson on grace. I'm going to Walmart. And you know what I'm going to buy? I'm going to buy some high quality boys deodorant. Because sometimes people don't need to hear that you care. They need to see that you care. And sometimes the grace of God may take the form of deodorant. And in that message I said, so if you're out there watching, I said this kind of jokingly, I said if anybody's got some gift card for Walmart, send them in because these boys are going to bankrupt me before it's over with, but I'm going to get them deodorant. Well, let me tell you something. How many know that there's still some good people in this country? I mean, there's some good people. I finished that message. I mean, I didn't realize that I had struck a nerve. Our assistant pastor came up to me. He's crying. He reached in his wallet, took out a $100 bill. He said, you go get those boys some deodorant. I, 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 I get to the door. The sheriff's department that runs security for our building, there had already been two people had left their home. Everybody's watching on TV. 
They had left their home. There were two cards already there for the boys, gift cards. A lady comes tearing in the parking lot almost as fast as your pastor. I mean, that's just boom. And uh, she, I don't, well, he's going to regret that. I mean, that's going to be a running joke all week. And uh, I'm trying to get to my car. What I found out later, this lady doesn't even attend our church. She's a retired teacher in the area, and she's crying. She's got $5 bills rolled up in hair breaths. And she said, get, she probably saved them for 100 years. She said, give those to the boys. Uh, our head deacon called that afternoon and said, bless God, I can get the odor anytime I want. We're going to call a special deacon's meeting. We're going to have a check tonight. You get those boys to the odor. Next Thursday. Long story short, we're back in the same room having devotions, having our meal. But the whole window sills filled, not only with deodorant and body wash, soap, and, but new basketballs, footballs, a new game system. S several thousand dollars had come in from the time I... And I looked at those boys and I said, here's the lesson today. People that you don't even know and will never meet you love Jesus and they love you so much. They're willing. You know what those boys saw? They saw the grace of God. Aren't you glad that when we need a touch from heaven that he never runs short? There is always an endless supply. There's no limit. When I first got to our place, I really wanted to be involved with our kids. I really wanted to, to show them that I cared. So I got this big idea that I was going to take all of our boys on campus with our workers, going to get the van, and we're going to go into Greenville and going to go bowling and go out to eat. And uh, I was very nervous because I, you know, I thought if I lose all the boys, it's going to be bad in the headlines. Executive director of the children's home loses all the children. They all run away. They're in the streets. So I was, we're at the bowling alley. The bowling alley in Greenville is like from 1950. They don't have computerized anything. You know, you got a pencil. I'm trying to keep score from all these lanes. And I mean, I'm a nervous wreck because I'm trying to keep everybody there. Got a couple workers with me. Then we can go anywhere you want to to eat. Guess where we went? Taco Bell. Here we are. And uh, I mean, goodness. And I've, uh, we've herded them all in there. They're all up at the counter. I'm talking to one of our workers and I look back. And all of the boys, they've been rowdy all night. They're all quiet. And they're not looking at the menu board. They're looking at me. I said, boys, have you ordered? No. And they looked around to the one that they elected their spokesman. He said to me, preacher, what is our limit? I said, what are you talking about? He said, how much can we spend? What is our limit? Man, that tore me up. Because you know what I thought about all the times I've been with my teenage boys in Taco Bell and McDonald's and I never had them ever ask, what is our limit? I never had anybody ask me that. I looked at those boys and I said, boys, tonight you're eating with the boss. And when you eat with a boss, there is no limit. You can get whatever you want. And how many know what a big mistake that was with 20 <laughs> teenage boys in Taco Bell? Aren't you glad that we serve a God who has abundant grace, abundant mercy? Barnabas, what is it that thrilled you? What is it so excited that you ran and got Paul? What is it that blessed your soul? What is it, community members of Antioch, that so impressed you that you called these fellows Christ followers Christians? Was it a song? Was it a church building? Did they have certain, did they, have, they just look real sharp, had suits and ties and dresses on? No, when he saw the grace of God. And so I close tonight with apologies to John Newton. I've rewritten a verse of his song for this sermon. Amazing grace, how sweet the sight. That shows God's love divine. The lost can only see God's love so pure and free. When it's shown from hearts like yours and mine. I wonder 
if anybody has seen grace. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word. Thank you for each one that's gathered here in this service tonight. And God, I pray that you would challenge us in this now time of invitation, a time where we invite folks to act on what they have heard. And tonight, we thank you for this story and Lord, how it challenges us. How it strikes us tonight that Barnabas got so stirred up, so blessed, so excited, so invigorated when he saw your grace. And he saw it because he saw it displayed in the hearts and the lives and the actions and the deeds and the words and the attitudes of your people in Antioch. And Lord, the challenge for us is clear in this first night of revival. Somebody needs to see your grace. We are the only Bible, we are the only testimony that some are going to ever read and we need to be at our best for you on a daily basis. If we're going to see revival, if we're going to see hearts change, if we're going to see this church grow, it's because that people will catch the vision of what we show them. If they're going to get excited about you, it's because we're excited. If they're going to love you, it's because we love you and we show it. Lord, maybe some of us just need to bow our knee tonight in this invitation and say, God, I need to do a better job. I need to be better advertisement for you. I want folks. Lord, maybe some would like to pray tonight. Lord, lay some soul, put some soul in my path that I can show and extend your grace to them this week even. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.